after this song. Yay! Yay! All right, this, tonight we're going to be talking about Solomon. First of all, let me give a shout out to my Uncle Eddie. You, you guys remember my Uncle Eddie and Aunt Mamie who used to, they came and sat here and um, my Aunt Mamie had a stroke a couple days ago, so please pray for her. As always, I always pray that God will just bring her closer, draw her closer in every and any way. She's doing okay. She started, she had very slurred speech, weakness on the left. She's getting all of it back. Uh, she had that same funny heart rhythm that dad had. Um, but instead of catching hers like they caught dad's, it actually sent a clot to her brain and she had a stroke. Um, but he watches every single service. Wednesday, I, everybody's cheering for you, Uncle Eddie. Everybody's cheering for you. He complains, by the way, that he can't hear any of your questions because we haven't mic'd the audience. You know, we haven't mic'd you guys. We have bought, we bought mics to hang. We just haven't put them up yet, but we do have them. But he complains every single week, and every single week say, well, we have mics, we just haven't put them up yet. But he watches every Sunday morning, 8.30, every Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, every Wednesday night. Every time he emails me a big, long email, and he tells me what questions he has, what he likes about, he was a, a teacher, a school teacher, a night school teacher for, oh, shoot, I don't remember, Eddie, sorry, 20-something years. And so... He'll give me tips. He'll say, next time do this, or this didn't make sense to me. And it's a great perspective because he's, he was, he's safe now. He's given his life to the Lord now. He went through a blue book. Um, but he was Jewish his whole life, married a Catholic. So he actually taught in, what is it called? The cate catechism classes? I think he taught catechism classes. They assumed he was Catholic because he was married to Mamie. And so they had him teaching sixth boy, sixth grade Boys, I think it was sixth grade boys. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting confused. Maybe I'm getting confused. But he taught catechism class. He didn't know how to, what to do. Anyway, um, that's what he said. That's what he said. He he didn't know. I think he bribed the nuns and said, "I'll teach you something if you teach me how to teach this class or something." Um, but anyway, so keep my aunt and uncle in your prayers. But he told me last time. He said, "Tell people what what I do is I teach the whole." kind of passage, and then at the very end, I give you the punchline, you know, the three passage, the, the point, the proposition and three points, like, okay, what are we going to learn from this at the very end? He said, you have to tell them that at the beginning, because otherwise, you think, well, why am I even listening to this? What benefit is this to me? Why do I need to pay attention to this? And, and I always feel like it's given the punchline ahead of time, like, well, why are they going to listen to me if I already give them the answer? But it absolutely made sense. So I'm going to try doing that a little bit today. So that is thanks to Uncle Eddie. So thanks, Uncle Eddie. Um, he said, um, when he, he called me today and he said, hey, it's Solomon, because he knew I was teaching Solomon. A couple days ago, he said, I might not be able to watch it live, depending on if your aunt's in or out of the hospital, but I'll at least be able to watch the recording. So he is very faithful. Oh, the lights. Da -da! All right, so Solomon. Who remembers Solomon? Who is Solomon? King David's son, good. What do you remember about him? Second king of, uh, third king of Israel, right? Because Saul and then David and then Solomon. Wisest man in the world. Anything else about Solomon? What's that? He was a murderer? Who, who did he murder? That was his daddy. His daddy was a murderer. Wrote lots of Proverbs, almost all of the Proverbs wrote Ecclesiastes, his Song of Solomon he wrote. That's a whole other issue. I, was, I forgot that I was going to even bring up Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, I mean, it, for those of you who have read it, it's just like this romantic little thing, and it's just kind of, it's a nasty chapter. Nobody ever teaches through it because nobody never, never knows how. But when they do teach through it, they teach through it like the beauty of a relationship and the beauty of a marriage and the beauty of human bodies, whatever. They, they talk about all that. He, he had, what, 60, 13 wives and 66? Oh, no, 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 the, that was Rehoboam. See, I got him confused with his son. He had 700 wives. Wisest man in the world, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Song of Solomon, to me, is not about this beautiful relationship between, I mean, if he had this deep, deep love and relationship with his one wife, why would he need 699 more of them and 300 concubines? What? So it tells me, don't fall for all that gushy stuff, ladies. If anything, the Song of Solomon tells me, don't fall for all that gushy stuff, because it obviously wasn't enough to keep him interested in her. He had to find 999 others. 
So whenever you hear the song that Solomon taught and they're talking about how beautiful the relationship is between Solomon and his wife, say, oh, fooey on all of that. That's why we never teach it. All right. <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah, now you have to teach it. But you better not teach that it's beautiful or that it was enough to keep them because if I were Solomon's wife, psh, 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 any of them, any of them. That's right. All right, what we're going to learn from Solomon, thanks to Uncle Eddie, I'm going to tell you stuff. We're going to learn from Solomon ahead of time. What we're going to learn from Solomon, smart people still do stupid things. And I know that's easy to say because we know a lot of smart people that do a lot of stupid things, but that applies to us too. So we can learn from this because we are not as smart as Solomon was. We're not even close. So if we can make, no, we don't make fun of him, but if we can make fun of him falling, if we can make fun of him being stupid, how stupid do you think we can be when we don't have the wisdom of Solomon so we can learn from his example like we're doing with all of these? So smart people still do stupid things. We're not above it. What does the Bible say? He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. As soon as you think, and we're the good group. As soon as we think we're the good group, we're going to get messed up. But we're the Wednesday night group. We come Sunday morning. We sometimes stay for two services. We come Wednesday night. We read our Bibles. We pray. And we think, ah, I wouldn't do anything so stupid. But there's something, there's some weakness that we have, which leads us to the next one. One character flaw or pet sin can ruin, not only a ministry, can ruin a life. Solomon was a good guy. Solomon was loved by God. Solomon loved God, but he had this one area in his life that we're going to be talking about, this one area in his life. Well, you guys already know because he had a thousand women, and they were, th well, this one area in his life that it was like a, a chink in his armor. Is that the phrase, a chink in his armor? And instead of dealing with it, instead of recognizing it and dealing with it, um, he let it get out of hand. And each one of us has some weak area in our life. Most of us hopefully know what it is or what they are. You know, if you could do one thing, if you could be spiritually more grown up in one area. Go ahead and answer your cell phone. Just kidding. <laughs> he never wants people to feel bad when their cell phones go off in church because he wants people to have their cell phones in church. So if there's an emergency that, like the day that Virginia and Rita and Greg got in that car accident, I had my phone on stun. On stun, we call it. On buzz. <laughs> well, yeah, we call it stun. I had it on buzz. So Rita had called me and I didn't get it. So Josh, fortunately, it was only about a mile down the street. Josh literally ran to come get me. But my phone was on, on silence. So Tony doesn't want you to ever feel awkward about putting your cell phone, having your cell phone on. I'll just embarrass you like I just embarrassed him, that's all. It's just people in his life ought to know he's in church Wednesday night at 6.30, 7.30. So anyway, one character flaw, one weakness I don't know if you guys have ever heard this or ever heard someone say this. When I was a teenager, old teenager, but a teenager, I heard someone say this. Well, none of us are perfect. So since none of us are perfect and we're all going to sin, this is the one I pick. Or, well, no one's perfect, and if that's, if that's the worst you do, well, then that's probably okay if that's the worst you do. Basically like, well, if 99% of your life is good or if 60% of your life is good, then it's okay about the other little things. We can't look at it like that. We're going to see from Solomon, we just can't look at it like that. One character flaw, one pet sin, one thing that we hold on to and say, okay, I'll sacrifice all these other things for the Lord, but this one thing I don't think I'm ready to give up for the Lord. Once we hold that, have that, that can ruin us. So just be careful. And then three, Oh, what did I put? Oh, godliness in most areas of your life don't, does not make up for sinfulness in others. Again, this isn't weighing. Okay, well, most of my life is good, so I can get away with these few things. Don't do it for your sake. It ruined Solomon, and it can ru ruin us. Uh, following God's word trumps everything. It doesn't matter how loved by God we are. It doesn't matter how wise we are. It doesn't matter. If we don't obey this, we're going to fall. If we just submit to God, if we just, what's that song, trust and obey? Shoot, I think it's just obey. You can learn to trust him. Just obey. Just do it, even if you're not sure. Can I trust God in this? Just obey, and he will show himself to be faithful. So following God's word trumps everything. That's what we're going to kind of learn today. Um, so, so, again, smart people do stupid things. Men seem to have a very particular skill at doing stupid things. See the guy on the ladder trying to, 
I know, I know. I think it must be in the DNA. And I, done you've done that? See? I think it must be in the DNA. What? See? Because only men would think of doing such stupid things like that. I'm a doctor, you can trust me. It's in the DNA. They seem to have particular issues with ladders, as you've seen. Here's a ladder on top of a table, on top of a table, on top of two tables, on top of the dirt. Um, but they also have issues with swimming pools. If you want to make, have brat and beer in your swimming pool, you have to have some way of plugging in the bratwurst cooker. So I might as well put it on. Those are little um, flip-flops that he has the extension cord on. Men are just sometimes not that bright. W women do it too. But as you can tell, they're all men in all these photos. They just seem to think they're invincible. They don't think through that, w <laughs> that when that broom hits that water, it's going to be projected upwards towards very sensitive information. <laughs> and as, as we've seen and as we can see, it often doesn't end well. <laughs> I didn't see that coming, did you? Let's see it <laughs> Oh, wait, there's another one there. Oh, it just stopped. Oh, well, there was actually another one, but you're not going to see it this time. Well, it was, a, it was two videos together, but it obviously didn't do it. You want to do it? Okay, go ahead and play it again. Is it not playing? Didn't see that coming, did you? Let's see it again. I'll have to show you the part two another time. I just made sure they played, but I didn't watch them through. Of course, it was another guy getting hurt in a swimming pool because that's just their thing. They can be creative. Men can be creative. I never would have thought of how to put on a pair of pants by jumping 15 feet off of that. I just wouldn't have thought about it. But they're just not very cautious. They don't seem to think through the dangers. It's something seems fun, seems cool, so they do it without really thinking it through. They don't even notice the danger when it's right in front of their face. <laughs> just smiling away. Solomon was like that. He was incredibly wise, but he didn't see the danger right in front of his face. He did some incredibly stupid things. You guys have a study guide? All right, we're going to be in the Bible study guide for a while. We're going to fly through this looking at Solomon's life. The first verse there in the blue box looks at um, when Solomon was born. If you remember, his, well, you guys had mentioned that David... <sighs> David basically fooled around with Bathsheba before they were married. She got pregnant. What happened to that baby? That baby died. It was a punishment. That's a whole other thing, but that was a punishment of their sin. Um, David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and she gave birth to another son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah, meaning loved by the Lord. I never hear Solomon being referred to as Jedediah. So I don't know if that was just a nickname. You know, hey, call him Jedediah just so he knows how much I love him. That's awesome. Can you imagine the Lord giving you a nickname? Especially one that says love by, lo li by the Lord. He'd probably give me a nickname like Shorty or Squirty or something. I don't know. I don't know. All right. So then as Amy had mentioned, Solomon became king. He was the third king of Israel. First Kings 3.1. So right at the white part there on the top of your study guide, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Do you see a problem with that? Did God tell the people of Israel, don't marry pagan daughters? Don't do it. Well, he was the king of Israel, and for political expediency, he made an alliance with the king of Egypt, and he married his daughter. Bad mistake. Verse 3, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. That was another no-no. Uh, they would go into Canaan, for example, take it over, but then take all these pagan worship sites and dedicate them to the Lord. It would be like us going into a Mormon church and praying to the Lord. And God said, don't do it. And he specifically said, don't worship and make sacrifices at the high places. But Solomon thought he was so wise. He was so wise. But instead of just obeying, he trusted in what made sense to him. And he made sacrifices on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. So he was where he shouldn't have been. And verse 5, at Gibeon, that high place where he shouldn't have been in the first place, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, stop. 
if you were God and you had a kid that you just loved so much and he was doing such a great job in every area of his life except what you're catching him doing right this moment and you show up right at that moment, what would you say to him? I'd say, knock it off, Solomon. Do you recognize that you're, do- you're so good, Solomon? I love you so much. You're doing such great things. But this is one area in your life, Solomon, that you're just blowing it. Do you remember where I said in this book and in this verse, do you remember where I said don't offer sacrifices at the high places and don't offer these pagan women because they're going to turn your heart away from me to do exactly what you're doing? Do you remember that I said that? But God didn't. And I find that intriguing. I think when God doesn't bust us in our sin, we think we can get away with it. When God doesn't, that's why we have those pet sins. God hasn't crushed me yet. So he must be okay with my life. If I'm doing all of this good and I'm just doing this little bit bad, well, shoot, God hasn't blasted me, so maybe I'm okay. God showed up to Solomon and didn't, Blast him. I just find that really intriguing. He said in the blue right there, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, oh wait, uh, yeah, let me go back to verse five just for context. At at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And Solomon, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to counter number. So give your servant a discerning or an understanding. I put some of the words in parentheses just because I looked in other uh, versions because I really wanted to know what did Solomon ask for? What did he really ask for and what did God give him? He said, give your servant a discerning or an understanding heart to govern your people and to distinguish or to discern between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. So I have there in the green box, Solomon asked God for wisdom in a dream, first of all. I don't think I ever really thought that through. I'm not going to make a big deal of it because I know, I don't believe that God speaks to us today in dreams. He clearly spoke to people in Old Testament times in dreams. But we give Solomon so much credit for asking God of something, he was asleep. Now, God gave him credit for it, so I will too, but I still think it's a little intriguing. God asked God, I mean, Solomon asked God for wisdom in a dream. He asked for discernment in governing, for distributing justice. So do you remember the first example where the two prostitutes are fighting over a baby and they both said, that baby's mine. No, that baby's mine. No, that baby's mine. No, that baby's mine. And they brought the case to Solomon and they said, what should we do? And what did Solomon say? Cut the baby in half. Well, that's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? That's a horrible thing to say. What if they would have done it? But what did the real mother do? No, 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 no. Give the baby to her. Give the baby to her. Don't kill the baby. And Solomon, in his wisdom, said, that is the real mother. The real mother is the one that was willing to sack, to give away her son to protect his life. That was the kind of wisdom that he asked for, wisdom and governing. It would be like Susanna Martinez asking God for wisdom to govern this great state of New Mexico. He didn't ask for wisdom to live a godly life necessarily, but how to lead others, um, not even to live a godly life, but just in governing. And I just find that interesting. Um, Where was I? Oh, verse 10. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administrating or understanding to discern justice, then I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise, and God is the one who used wisdom or wise. Uh, Solomon never exactly asked for wisdom. He asked for discernment. He asked for understanding. So you could say that that's the same thing, but God is the one who used that word. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never, that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So no one was wiser before you. No one will be wiser after you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, now right now, don't forget, Solomon is in the middle of acting in disobedience to God. So it's like God's way of flicking him in the ear without saying, dude, you're busted. Dude, you're right where I told you not to be. 
He said, if you walk in obedience to me and you keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized that it had been a dream. On the bottom of the page there, God was happy with his request. I kept putting it in quotes because I can't give him too much credit for requesting it in his dream, but whatever. God was happy with his request because Solomon took his leadership seriously and Solomon took his limitations seriously. That's a good thing. He had a humble spirit to say, God, you've given me such an incredible responsibility. Please let me govern wisely. He asked for a good thing. He could have asked for long life. He could have asked for wealth. He could have asked for his enemies to be destroyed. And God said, you know what? Because you were thinking of other people above yourself, I'm going to honor that and I'm going to give you even the things you didn't ask for. That was good. All of that's good. Okay, top of page two. So what happened? First Kings, this is supposed to be 11.1. It was a typo, and we printed it before I, ch- I realized it. But that's 1 Kings 11.1, 1, if you guys are going to keep this and look later. King Solomon, it says, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. So that little chink in his armor, that little mistake that he had, God showed up right at that time because that Pharaoh's daughter apparently had already turned his heart towards doing what he shouldn't have done, worshiping other gods, worshiping in the high places. God kind of flicked his ear to say, hey, dude, if you obey me, All is going to go well. But he didn't actually specifically say, hey, I know what you're doing. Anyway, King Solomon loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. They were from nations about which the Lord specifically had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their God. So God had specifically told them, don't do this. And Solomon did it anyway. Nevertheless, the Bible says, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. As as Solomon grew old, his wives did in fact, just like God said, turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sinanites, and Moloch, the detestable gods of the Ammonites. Do you remember? I remembered Moloch. I had to look up the other ones. Do you remember what Moloch did? How How they worshiped Moloch? how they sacrificed to Moloch. They put their babies, their children, in, their, in his arms and burned them alive. Burned their babies alive. Um, that first one, that Ash, Ashereth, Ashtoreth, um, when I looked that one up, there was a king of the Midianites, Sidonites, one, one of those ites. And he was at war. They were at war with another country. And it said that they took his, he took his oldest son, who is in line to be the next king. So he was already grown. His oldest son in line for the king, and he burned him on the wall during the battle so that he could get victory. So that's how they worshipped these false gods. Uh, where was I? Verse 6. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord became very angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. And then last week we studied Rehoboam, which was Solomon's son. And what happened under Rehoboam's reign? The kingdom was torn in half. So God said, because you've apparently held on tighter to this sin than you have for your devotion to me, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. Okay, so what can we learn from Solomon? First of all, Solomon, let's see, wisdom to lead with reason isn't the same as wisdom to live in righteousness. Solomon asked for wisdom to lead with reason. That's a good thing. It just... I mean, God honored it. So it wasn't a bad thing. I can't say, well, that was a stupid thing to ask for. It was a good thing, but it wasn't enough. I mean, if we can ask for anything, I mean, if God's going to show up to us in a dream, I don't think he shows up to us in a dream right now. But if you're going to pray for anything, instead of praying to lead with reason, pray to be able to live in righteousness. Because Solomon, as wise as he was, as discerning as he was to be able to tell right from wrong, He just didn't live it, at least not in this huge area of his life. It started as a little thing. You know how they they say, I mean, you don't jump into big sin, just, you know, you're living righteously and then you're in, in the middle of big sin. It's like a slow fade. 
You just slowly compromise. You compromise just a tiny bit, and guess what? You get away with it, and it's kind of fun. So then you compromise just a little bit more, and you get away with it, and it's a little more fun. And then pretty soon, you're compromising big, big time. He married one woman, the Pharaoh's daughter. Fine, he did some sacrifices to appease her in the high places he wasn't supposed to, but big deal. God showed up to him. He's in the middle of doing what he shouldn't have done. And God said, all right, Solomon, you tell me anything you want. And Solomon told him, and he said, okay, Solomon, but be careful to obey my commands. And Solomon, because God didn't blast him, maybe, thought, well, apparently this isn't a big deal because God didn't blast me right there. And he kept on doing it. So wisdom to lead with right reason is not the same as wisdom to live in righteousness. So what can we learn from Solomon? Number one, respect your weaknesses. It sounds like a silly word to use, respect. But don't just recognize your weaknesses. Respect the power that they have in your life. Don't blow them off. Don't say, ah, that's my Irish blood. Oh, that's just the way my family talks. Oh, that's just the way I was raised. Oh, we all drink like that, or oh, we all get a little angry like that, or we all kind of lash out like that. Respect your weaknesses. If you don't, don't be surprised if you suffer the consequences. We're down here in the, the blue box on the second page. Respect your weaknesses. I put when we get saved, God takes away our wickedness, our sin, but he doesn't take away our weaknesses. Do you guys buy that? He takes away our wickedness. He forgives us, forgives us for our sin, but he doesn't take away our weaknesses. If I was a bad dresser before I got saved, am I going to be a bad dresser after I get saved? If I'm a bad singer before I get saved, am I going to be? A, yes. He doesn't, I mean, he, cha- he takes away our sin, but we're still us. If I struggled with cussing before I got saved, am I going to struggle with cussing after I got, got saved? Yeah. You can beat it. You can fix it. I mean, kind of like I struggled with smoking before I got saved. Am I going to struggle after I get saved? Yeah, you can beat it. You can fix it. You have control. You're not a victim. But that doesn't mean the struggle isn't going to be there. And if I struggled with anger before I got saved, do you think I'm going to struggle a little bit with anger? You think that might be a little chink in my armor? If I struggled with whatever, put the sin in there that you want, arrogance, pride, Lay any of it. If I struggled with that before I got saved, I'm still going to struggle after I got saved. In those moments of weakness, where do you think Satan's going to hit us? He knows. He knows what our weaknesses are. He knows better than we know what our weaknesses are. You don't think he knows what bait to put in front of our... I mean, if you're going to tempt me, don't tempt me with a... What are those little fishies called? Those little salty fishies? Sardine or what did you say? Anchovies? Don't put that in my face or put it in my face. I'm going to ignore it. Put a brownie. Oh, put a little piece of cheesecake. Oh, I mean, at least tempt me with something good. You think God knows what my brownie is? You think Satan knows what my brownie is, what my cheesecake is? You know he does. And when we get to the place where we no longer respect our weaknesses, we think, ah, I dealt with that. Ah, I've been sober for two years. Oh, yeah, big shot. You think Satan wants to trip you up? Oh, yeah? Let me put you in a situation where you want that drink more than anything else in this world. We have to respect our weaknesses. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing faithless about that to respect your weaknesses. Okay. You wish your girlfriend was fun like me. Don't you? What's your name? Rachel. Rachel. And what do you do for a living? Nothing. I'm lazy at the moment. Do you ever sing professionally? Yeah, of course. I've been singing all my life, all around the towns and everything. Okay. Do you think that you're capable of winning this contest? Yeah. And how good from one to ten would you rate yourself? Ten. Ten? Whatever song you want me to sing, I'll do it. Gwen Stefani, I can sing. Prince, I can sing. Sheila E, Kylie, Dan. I probably could do Danny as well. I can sing. Better than Madonna. You're better. Yeah, I think. Go on, then. All right, can I have a microphone then, please? Is you holding a stick above my head? It'll find you. Where I come from, there's a place called heaven. And that's the place where all the good children go. 
I desire a silver, the strips of gold But there's more where you come from My sugar walls, my sugar walls Ooh, My sugar walls <laughs> It was good, wasn't it? Let's face it No No You've got a really bad attitude, sweetheart mm. Everything I wouldn't want Lazy, deluded, very little talent. <laughs> Everything I that don't is... want. Well, you ask for an opinion, sweetheart, you're getting one. The way you lot live your life, you're all <laughs> jealous <laughs> is all to get where you want to be. You can't really hear most of the rest because every other word is. I you know you. <laughs> and that is the truth of the matter. Why did you come here? Why did I come Why'd here? You come because here today? I know it was good, all right? Right, do you want to leave now? Well, I've even done my own cassette. Rachel, I think, I think you should go somewhere anyway. else. Nobody so. does cassettes anymore. It's called a CD. That's very rude, isn't it? All right, just what leave. What kind of people are you? Rachel, just leave now. Kiss my all away. Please. And I'd get your hands off me as well because... At the end of the day, you can... She knows a lot of words. Respect your weaknesses. If we don't respect our weaknesses, don't be surprised if you have to suffer the consequences of those weaknesses. Everybody else around you probably already knows what your weaknesses are. You think that they knew she had an attitude before she ever sang? You think her friends know that she has that kind of an attitude? But she didn't recognize it. She didn't recognize, I mean, she was truly surprised when they said, uh, you're awful. Is that what she needed to hear, by the way? What Simon Cowell, Cowell? Cow so what Simon Cowell told her, is that what she needed to hear? That's exactly what she needed to hear. Did she hear it? No. And that happens to us all the time. We hear what we need to hear. Tony tells us what we need to hear. But so often, do you think that would have hurt my feelings if Simon Cowell spoke to me that way? You're delusional, you have no talent. You think that would have hurt my feelings? Yeah. You think that would have made me want to feel defensive? Yeah. But if we humble ourselves, and learn from what God is trying to tell us, then maybe we can actually learn from it um, rather than just staying in our weakness. So respect your weaknesses. Number two, what else can we learn from Solomon? Again, respect your weakness and reflect on his wisdom. Solomon's. Some, uh, Solomon didn't live it. He had the wisdom, he just didn't use the wisdom. But he had the wisdom. He recorded the wisdom for us in the book of Proverbs, in Ecclesiastes, not in Song of Solomon, as he recorded something else there, but we have the wisdom of God. We not only have Solomon's wisdom, we have all of God's wisdom right here. How big, I mean, this is, this is a study Bible. This is a, a big old Bible. Pick up a regular Bible, one that's not a study Bible. How many books in school did we read that were that size? A lot, a lot. Tale of Two Cities and Scarlet Letter and all these 1984, that's how old I am. Read tons of books that size. I read Cliff Notes. I knew these books enough for me to take tests on them. How well do we know God's word? Really? How well do we know it? We have the wisdom. We just need to use it. Solomon had the wisdom. He just didn't use it, and it wrecked his life. It doesn't do us any good. This is a treasure that we have. It doesn't do us any good if we don't Use it. Some of you may have seen this one. Seuraava kohde on min dynastian aikainen vaasi. Lähtöhinta 500 000, olkaa hyvä, tehkää tarjouksia. 600 000 siellä herran, 700 000 puhelimessa, 800 000 rouva, 900 000 puhelimessa, miljoona siellä herra. Tuleeko muita tarjouksia? Ei tule. Miljoona ensimmäinen, miljoona toinen, miljoona kolmas. That was funny how many of you guys went, <gasps> a million euros is like $1.25 million. I don't know if that was real or not. But wow, we have a treasure worth even more than that right here. That vase isn't going to do anybody any good because they can never use it. And this, as much of a treasure as this is, this has the keys to life and death eternal life, eternal death. This has all of everything we need. The, uh, was it in Hebrews? Uh, no. All we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Second Peter, 
Everything we need for life and godliness is through the knowledge of him through this book. Worth way more than a million dollars, but it does no good. It's as worthless as that Ming vase that's psh, It's as worthless as that if we don't use it. So number two of what we can learn from Solomon was reflect on his wisdom. Number three, what can we learn from Solomon? So the first one was respect your weaknesses. Second, reflect on his wisdom. Third, reject all wickedness. I know that sounds like a no-brainer thing, but we just have to be willing to follow God no matter what. We just have to, whether we understand it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether we feel it or not, we have to think it through ahead of time so that when somebody says, well, it's okay for two men to love each other as long as it's consensual and they love each other, it's okay. We have to be willing to say or to at least believe well, as much as I might want to believe that or as much as that might make sense to you, it doesn't matter. God said no. Well, she's too young to have a baby now. It'll ruin her. She'll have to drop out of school, and she's too young to have this. Uh, and abortion is a perfectly legal procedure, and it, it wouldn't be legal if it were wrong, and it just doesn't make any sense to force this poor 16-year-old girl to have a baby. As much as emotionally we might want to say, oh, that makes so much sense. 30-minute procedure, and she can get back on with her life, whereas otherwise, if she has that baby, it's going to steer the rest of her life. As much as that might make sense, we don't start with what makes sense to us. We, make sen- we start with what makes sense to God. And if God says it's wrong, we should quit trying to rationalize it and quit trying to um, make it something that it isn't. It's sin, whatever it is. Does it make sense? If I were writing the Bible, I might have left out some of those things. I might have said, you know what? If they're two adult per- people, psh, I don't care. Do whatever you want, bind your bedroom doors. But I'm not God. And he made it very clear what's okay and what isn't. And we need to submit to that and follow that whether we believe it or not. We need to be willing to follow no matter what. Sure. It looks ordinary enough, a mother duck nesting on a ledge in downtown Spokane, Washington, and a banker watching from his second floor window. But when the ducks hatched and the mother needed to get her ducklings to fresh water, one big problem became obvious. The dozen day old ducks couldn't follow. They were stuck on the ledge, nervously pacing back and forth. Enter the banker, Joel Armstrong, down on the sidewalk to help when suddenly, the first two dropped like stones. A center fielder couldn't have done better. Come on, go with your mommy. There you go. He kept up the chatter with mom, who was waiting at his ankles, as a crowd started to build. It's great. <laughs> He's a good catcher. One at a time with a steady hand and keen eye. This mild-mannered loan officer talked an entire family of baby ducks off a ledge. Together, the banker and the mother duck led the babies to water, straight down the middle of a downtown parade route, through the streets, around crowd barriers, and finally, home, the river. Those little baby ducks, I mean, the banker, you got it, the banker was just looking down from his second story window, and he saw the mom go down, and he saw the baby start walking on the ledge, because they know they're supposed to follow but they can't do it. So he goes down just to see what's going to happen, just to be of assistance, and all of a sudden the first two just boom, boom. It's not like he said, here, little chicky, here, little chicky, and then it listened to his voice. They just jumped. They were willing to follow that mother, even if it meant them plopping on the sidewalk. Fortunately, this good guy was there to catch them, and after he caught all of them, the mother duck and all the little babies were willing to follow that man and a woman was helping him as well, follow a man and a woman to get him to the water. We have to be like those little chickies, where when God tells us to do something, it may make no sense to us at all. We may say, oh God, I'm not strong enough to do that. I don't have the strength. I don't have the faith. I don't have the money. I don't have the whatever to do that. Now we have to be careful who we're following. That doesn't mean, I mean, we hear of examples every single week of people who get calls or get messaged or get Um, solicited, you know, and say, you know, send this money and we'll give you a miracle. No kidding. It's 
horrible. Uh, Tony's going to talk about it this, you mean just, we had a, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sensitive. We had a person at our church who's currently attending our church and they, and they did say it was okay to tell the story. Uh, Tony's going to talk about it more, I think, on Sunday morning. Um, and this person called because this person didn't know what to do um, because th- this person was getting messaged on Facebook. I guess the, the person had friended a particular ministry. Should I tell the ministry? Joyce Meyer's ministry. Paula White, sorry, you're right, Paula White. Thank you, sorry, Joycey. Yeah, it was Paula White. And this person saying that she, that she was Paula White was communicating with this other person and said a particular situation that this person had shared with Paula White, you know, please pray for my family um, for this particular situation. Paula White, I'm sure it wasn't Paula White, but someone that was in the Paula White ministry enough to Facebook on her behalf said, oh, beloved, started every sentence with beloved, oh, beloved, um, you need to pray hard. I had a dream about this family member that you asked me about, um, and the dream involved death. So this person messaged back. That doesn't sound good. Paula White said, no, it isn't good. Can you fast for four days? Yes. Um, You need to not eat anything from 4 p.m. until 2 a.m. for four days in a row and you need to pray this specific prayer at this specific time every day at that time. Can you do that? Yes. You know, thinking, if I'm going to save my family member from death, and it's just a matter of not eating or drinking and praying at a certain time, yes, supposedly this is a person of God, a ministry of God, yes. And I need you to give $500 to this orphanage. I, I, don't, I don't have that money. Beloved, this is a dire situation. These are dire circumstances, and you need to step out in faith. Um, You need to do this by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. This just happened to one of our church people. They messaged this person during the day several times. Hello, beloved. How are you, beloved? Hello, beloved. Then when she said that when this person said that they couldn't complete, can, couldn't do $500. Well, how much can you do? Like God is bargaining with her, right? Well, how much could you do? I, I can't do anything. Uh, you know, I have a family that I'm supporting and I have, I, I, I can't. I don't even get paid until tonight. What time do you get paid? Well, it, it varies and, or what time do you get off? Because she's getting paid that night. What time do you get off? Well, it varies, but the banks close at five o'clock, this person said. Well, do it on your break then. You have time during your break to do it. Well, at this point, the person's getting suspicious anyway, but scared to death because a big ministry. And th- so this person said, please forgive my lack of faith. Please forgive my doubt, but I don't know that God does miracles for money. I don't have the money. I just gave $50 to this orphanage last week or last month. I don't don't have the money. Well, I'm going to have the orphans pray for you. So it was a specific ministry that this person over, this Paula White oversaw, oversees. Uh, I'm going to have the orphans pray for you, and this is part of Um, God's blessing. This is part of what you need to do. And later that night, at one o'clock, it was almost two o'clock in the morning. Almost two o'clock in the morning, she gets messaged again. Beloved, did you complete your task? And so she called, this person called and didn't know what to do. Scared to death. Because this person of God, this leader of this big ministry, had this dream involving death, and you're supposed to do these things. Can you fast for four days? Yes. Can you pray this particular prayer at this time every single day? Yes. And you need to write a check for $500 to some Nigerian address. And was so torn up because 
this person wanted to follow God, wanted to follow this ministry because thought they were speaking as a mouthpiece of God. We have to be careful who we follow. It's not just a matter of, oh, they speak a God word. If they, oh, but he says he loves God, I can date him. What does he really believe about God? What does he really believe about the Savior and the scriptures and salvation? What do they really believe? If you don't know, then don't mess with them. Don't get close to them. Does that make sense? If you're going to be a baby duck following your mama duck and following some banker dude, make sure that it comes out of this. Make sure you're following God's advice. If Tony or I, but Tony is the preacher, if he ever teaches something that doesn't come out of this, ignore it. Even better, talk to him. Hey, Tony, I have a concern about this. Why did you say this? I bet you he has a reason. And if not, he'll say, hmm, I don't know. Let me chew on that. And he'll go home, and you know what he'll do? Look at this, and he'll look at this, and he'll look at this, and he'll look at this. Because God holds us accountable to rightly divide the word of truth. Does that make sense? So we have to be careful who we follow, but if we're following this, be willing to follow no matter what. It doesn't matter what we think about it. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. It doesn't matter our impressions that we have, or it doesn't matter what somebody else says about a situation. What matters is what God says about a situation. We have to be careful. Anything else you want to say about that or anything else I missed about that? Scary all right, cool. So what are the three things that we can learn from Solomon? Here, a little study guide. You can even look. Respect your weaknesses. Whatever your weakness is, you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, shoot, ask your husband, ask your wife. They know. <laughs> they know. Guaranteed. Ask your kids. They know. You'll probably pop them in the face for telling you. But ask them. They know. Just like you know your kids' weaknesses. Respect them. Respect the power of your weaknesses and know that's exactly what Satan may use to trip you up or whether you're, what your flesh may just trip you up. It's not Satan necessarily. Reflect on his wisdom. Not just Solomon's, but God's wisdom. But it doesn't do us any good if we don't use it. Uh, and number three, reject all wickedness. So I put there in the, the last, I'd rather have a heart of obedience than a heart of understanding. If I could, if I, you know how we're told to pray for wisdom. It's good to pray for wisdom. But more than wisdom, I want a heart of obedience. A heart where when God says to do something, I just do it. I said I'd rather be dumber than a doorknob, but be willing to follow God no matter what, than have more insight than Solomon and not use that wisdom to follow God. It's all about following God. Cool? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for all of these examples of godly people who just messed up. God, we will never be as wise as Solomon. I don't know that we'll ever be as loved as Solomon as much as I know you love each and every one of us. You loved Solomon a special way. You chose him a special way. But God, I pray that we would have hearts of obedience. God, even more important than wisdom, hearts that are willing to follow you no matter what. God, please give us hearts like that. God, please help us lead the people around us, our kids, our neighbors, our husbands, our wives. Help them see that example in us, that we love you more than anything. And God, help us recognize those weak areas in our lives and help us protect ourselves against them, away from them. God, so that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be lured away. We wouldn't be suckered by some stupid temptation. We love you. Thank you for letting us learn from all of these people. In your name we pray, amen.